Hey guys, welcome. Good to see you all. Go ahead and grab a seat wherever you guys want. Would it be possible, could somebody move so they can get a few seats together? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, if you could, Cynthia, you can move over one for them. Um, so a couple things in this class. Remember, we're painting the picture of what it might have been like in the upper room. We're getting a sense of the unique characters that surrounded Jesus, his disciples mostly, um, in the final night that he was betrayed. And then we're also seeing that Jesus laces into his final teaching to his disciples words that were actually spoken. In some places, he actually specifically says, everyone that is going to ever hear through the teaching of these people, I pray for them, right? Or he says something to Peter, as we'll see here, that actually his words to Peter on the night that Jesus is betrayed actually foreshadow how Peter one day himself will be crucified, right? And so you have this amazing uh, encapsulation of both this intimate final time that his disciples are there together. And also, if you think about it, I'm going to do a session where we kind of look at the Passover. But when you think about going all the way back to Moses and him taking the children of Israel through the Exodus out of Egypt, um, when Moses did the things that he did, Passover, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, the various implements um, of the Passover Seder, he was prophesying something that would be fulfilled in Jesus's final night in that small room with his beloved disciples that we look back to even today. For those of you that were at our Global Bridegroom Fast, we took communion today and we remembered the fulfillment of the Passover in that, the body and blood of Jesus. And that's what he did at the beginning of his sufferings there in the upper room. And so as I said in the first class, the Sermon on the Mount was the introduction of Jesus' ministry. These are his final words to his disciples, and we get to peer into that conversation. Um, and even in John 17, we'll see the intertrinitarian dialogue. We'll actually see a conversation. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, speaking to the Father, the first person of the Trinity, through the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Right? And I can't wait till we get to that section. So just zooming out for a moment. And we will finally wrap up chapter 13 tonight. Praise God. <laughs> and you guys pray and believe for me to get through uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in the uh, coming weeks. But we'll wrap up chapter 13 tonight. And I, I, I could have gone a little further, but I felt like we were just supposed to stop there. So, um, so I feel excited. And we're going to talk about the specific, the highlight of this portion that we're going to talk about today is Jesus gives his disciples a new commandment. And that means that he's telling them something in this final encounter, that three and a half years of discipleship, he's never told them to do it like this before. And he waits till this final moment before he goes to his suffering, and he says, this is, this is a new commandment that I'm giving you, right? And so obviously, you should just double highlight that, star that in your Bible. What is Jesus actually saying when he gives them a new commandment? I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, John 13, 21, read with me. We're going verse by verse. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified saying, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And I wanted to kind of park on this phrase, troubled in spirit for a moment, because I feel like we can kind of gloss over some of these portions of scripture that reveal to us the depth of the humanity of the person of Jesus, right? We see in this passage um, a picture of humanity, Jesus, and his deep fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He's troubled in his spirit, but that spirit is the spirit of God inside of him, right? There was no separation between the spirit of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He was fully one with God. He both prays and prophesies powerfully from this place of communion with the Holy Spirit. These declarations were not recited in King James English <laughs> or ecstatically prophesied as though by a spirit of divination. So what I want us to grasp and why I'm saying that that way is I think we get this idea that like sometimes um, when Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, one will betray me. It's like my kid's Bible version of it. Where it's like, most assuredly, I say to you like that, even that for, most assuredly, like who talks like that, right? Like most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And like when you watch the movie version of it, it's like, most assuredly, I say to you, he's perfectly calm. It's... <laughs> It's Jesus fully in command, fully in control. But what this verse tells us is he was troubled 
in spirit. Like he was deeply moved emotionally over the fact that one of his beloved disciples, he dreamed, was about to betray him and he was not okay. And have you ever had a moment? I don't know if anybody, maybe it's just me. Had a moment where you're just not okay. And you know something is in the will of God. You know that it's unfolding as God intended, but you're just not fully okay with it. I see people in the room going, oh my gosh, that was yesterday. It was today. <laughs> and I just, I pulled all the verses. We'll just do it real quick. We'll just do a quick survey. All the places that I know of where it says deep, Jesus was deeply troubled by something. You know, and I think it's so important for us to grasp that because he's not like robot Jesus. Like he had real feelings. He's also not unhinged. You know, he's not crazy either. He's, but he's human. He's connected to his spirit and he's aware he's, he's getting insight by the Holy Spirit. One of these, one of these guys betray me. And I don't, I don't know. I, I really think, just go with me on this because he says to John later, he says, the one to whom I hand this piece of bread is the one that's going to betray me. It may in fact be, we don't see that he had any insight pri prior to this moment, which of these guys it is. It may in fact be that it's being revealed to Jesus real time as he's sharing it with the disciples. He's looking at that. He knows one of them is, he's troubled. And I, I think the way it reads, that's what makes the most sense to me. He's troubled in spirit. He goes, one of you will betray me, right? And then Peter's like, John, you're tight with him. Get him to tell us which one, you know, and I think Peter's like, so I can take that guy out. <laughs> that's how Peter is. He's like, which one's going to betray us? And then Jesus says, it's the one to whom I I'm going to hand the bread. And I think Jesus may be getting this real time in the moment, right? You know, it's James, Andrew, and he's looking around the face of below, and, he, and he cut, his eyes fall on Judas and he knows it's Judas. And he gives him the bread and says, what you do, do quickly. So these are the places where Jesus is troubled. John eleven thirty two, Mary came to where Jesus was. This is after Lazarus has died. She falls down his feet. This is his beloved Mary Bethany, who would later pour the oil out on him and anoint him for burial. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. John eleven thirty three. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping says he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Now he had already told his disciples that Lazarus was going to rise from the dead, right? So he already knew that the outcome was positive, but Jesus is deeply affected, even as one who sees the end from the beginning. It's so important for us to know Jesus is still totally with us in our pain. Even though he knows the miracle is going to happen, or even though he knows that there's de ultimately deliverance from death, he's never looking at us patronizing, going, Mary, don't cry. It's going to be fine. Patting her on the head. I can do this with my wife, right? <laughs> Patting her on the head. You got to fix my button. Are they off? Yes. Okay. I know. I didn't want to interrupt. I think it's this is the benefit of having my wife in class on the front row. Thank you, honey. Everybody, everybody on the video, you have my wife to thank for that. Give a hand for Hannah. All right. So he was groaned in spirit. He was troubled. Where have you laid them? He said, Lord, come and see. And it says, the shortest verse in the Bible, two words, Jesus wept. Right? Troubled in spirit. Groaning, I believe, in intercession. We'll look at Romans 8 where it describes the spirit groans inwardly within us. Um, and that groaning is intercessory. It is the spirit, but it is also our human emotion, right? Like, and that's something that's so important for us to understand as an intercessory community. There are moments that the spirit of God comes on us. We're groaning inwardly in the spirit, but that's going to come out expressed in tears, expressed in sighs, expressed in deep wails. It's going to come out expressing itself in human emotion because that's how the Holy Spirit expressed himself in the life of Jesus right? Luke 19, 41, he draws near, he sees the city and he wept over it. And he prophesies over Jerusalem with weeping. If you had known, even you, especially in this day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment around you, surround you and close you in on every side. And this happens before that generation passes away by AD 70 within a short window of time. It's AD 30 at that point within 40 years, that city is going to fall um, to uh, Roman siege. 
and that city uh, close you on every side, level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you one stone upon the other because you did not know the time of your visitation. So Jesus approaches in Luke 19, the city of Jerusalem, knowing that he's going into that city to suffer and die at the hands of those people. And his heart is not moved in anger at what he's about to suffer. His heart is weeping because their inability to recognize him as their true Messiah is going to ultimately result in their judgment. But his response to their judgment is not, I told you so. <laughs> it's not vindictive or wrathful in that moment. It's he's crying before the Father for the, for the mercy of Jerusalem. But yet, So it's the spirit of God inside of him, right? But it that spirit is moving him to tears. That's what I want us to see. Like the Holy Spirit is fully possessing the Son of God, but yet the Holy Spirit in him is moving him in compassion and in mercy, and he weeps. John 12, 20, there were certain Greeks who came up to worship at his feet, at worship at the feast, excuse me. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, Galilee, as saying, hey, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. So there are these Greeks that are kind of treated a little differently than the Jews um, because they're Jews by conversion, right? They're the Hellenist Jews. And there's kind of a, we won't get into all of it now, but there's a little bit of like an insider-outsider thing. And so they're going to the disciples that they think are going to be sympathetic to try and get an audience with Jesus. And this is all happening, and Jesus says, um, answered them saying, the hours come the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And here's what I want us to grasp as in so many of these passages that I'm highlighting, even when we're thinking about the upper room. Again, you hear that, lest a grain of wheat fall to the ground. In our minds, we think of the pastor who has preached that message, and we've heard them talk about discipleship in that way. Who's familiar with that passage, right? We're all familiar with that passage. Do we imagine Jesus, when he's saying that, deeply troubled because he's describing what he's about to suffer? He's not just preaching a good sermon message on how we all have to suffer together. He's going, I'm the grain of wheat. I'm about to fall to the ground. And that, what we ha it, it's just, we just have to see the beauty of the humanity of Jesus. He embraced it despite being deeply troubled by it. He says, my soul is troubled. <laughs> what I just told you, I'm troubled by it because it's going to require much of me. But what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Now, why would he say that? Because he wants the Father to save him from this hour. But he's going, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He's having a moment, even before he re reaches the Garden of Gethsemane, where he goes, I'm, I'm troubled in my humanity about this, but it's not about my glory. It's about God's glory. Your will be done, not mine. And what I want you to get, okay, because I believe the Father works in our own lives in the same way. The comforting voice of the Father responds to Jesus' humility, submission, his troubled cry. And, and get this, there's only one of three times that this occurs. It occurs at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It occurs on the Mount of Transfiguration where there's an audible voice of the Father. And then it occurs at this moment where Jesus is troubled in spirit and filled with, I, I think, a certain degree of doubt, but resolution to obey the Father. It literally says the heavens opened and the Father says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. He tells him, because you are committed to, and, and it says, therefore the people stood by and heard it, and some of them said it must have, so that must have just been thunder, but some people distinguish the actual voice, the actual audible voice that speaks over Jesus. Others says, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world, the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I, if I am lifted up in the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this signifying what kind of death he would die. So my point in identifying these passages is Jesus saw with clarity the suffering that laid before him. He saw the, the suffering that was in Jerusalem. He saw his own suffering and, uh, and he was troubled in his spirit about it because he was both God but also deeply human. 
final place, um, we'll just look at this final verse, Luke 22, 44. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, just a few hours later, removed from the upper room. It says, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Mm. Right? Literally, he, he, he prays with such intensity in the power of the Holy Spirit that his blood vessels break. And I, I want you to pay attention here and just to look in this passage because it connects to what he's about to say to Peter and what he's about to say to Judas. And um, it says, when he gives them instruction, he's actually telling them pray for something very specific. And I hadn't seen this before. Pray that you may not enter into temptation, right? That's what he tells his disciples. And he withdraws from them out of stone's throw away. He kneels down and he prays this, Father, if, it's, if it's your will, take this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he's praying with such an intensity that an angel actually appears to him from heaven, strengthening him. Now, I don't have a, I've felt a angelic presence before in ministry, but there's one particular story that I'll share with you guys where uh, I, I worked at a summer camp with a, one guy's name was Chad. And Chad worked at this camp in Texas, and he and I had been friends at another summer camp the summer before. And we, Hannah and I and this guy Chad and another guy Jonathan had all gone out to this camp in Texas to work together for the summer. And Chad was like a, uh, a really, uh, he was kind of a, a, a bit of a jock. He's a lot bigger than I am. We once had to actually fight on this flotation device. He beat me pretty bad. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> at summer camp. So, but Chad, Chad was a good hearted guy, but he was not a, a super spiritual, uh, charismatic kind of person. You know, he's imagine just kind of a jock summer camp dude. And a couple weeks into uh, our, our camp experience, he was so worn out and tired that he was thinking about quitting. And, um, and he told me, uh, this a few weeks removed from the experience that he had, but he was praying and just asking God to help him. And he said while he was praying, he felt this hand on his back in prayer. And, uh, and, and then he ends up laying down in his bed and he, he said he felt like someone was holding his feet and he felt all this energy come into his, his body, he said. And there was no one there. Um, but he came to me because I guess he thought I was a little more of the charismatic guy. <laughs> a few weeks later, he goes, I had something happen to me and I have to tell you about it. He goes, I was praying. It felt like someone's holding my feet. He said, I got filled with this like supernatural energy and strength. And he goes, I was thinking about quitting because I was so tired. He goes, I have had like this supernatural energy on me for, for weeks now. He goes, I'm still running off whatever the, you know, the supercharge I got. And he goes, what do you think? You know, what do you what do you think about it? Am I crazy? Like, what, what do you think about this? He's like, I knew you'd believe me, but what do you think about it? And I, and we looked at this, I looked at this verse and it was like, yeah, no, Jesus was strengthened. It also says there was another time of temptation that Jesus experienced strengthening from the angels, right? I believe it's in the book of Mark. It says after his temptation in the wilderness, when Satan came to him, angels came to him and strengthened him, right? We're, I'm going to keep coming back to it because it's just mind blowing. It says Jesus created everything with his words, right? John makes that really clear. John chapter one, the word became flesh and dwelt among men, but it was by him, through him, for him, all things were created. Mm -hmm. So God creates all the angels, all creation. Then he takes on human form. To, he becomes so human that the angels he created are now strengthening him. What kind of humility is that, that Jesus has so humbled himself that he's the God of the universe who there, he is only light. There is no darkness. There is no shadow in him, but he is now susceptible to temptation because the only way he could reclaim victory and redemption for humanity is to be vulnerable to this kind of temptation in the garden where he wants to do his will, but instead he chooses to do the will of the father and reverses the curse that was released in the garden of Eden by Adam, where he said, I'm going to do my will instead of God's will, thus becoming the second Adam and the firstborn among many brethren. And he possesses redemption for us by becoming susceptible to temptation, yet saying, no, not my will, but yours be done. Wow. And the angels, I mean, imagine if your job is, okay, so God became a man and God the Father sends 
let's just say Angel Larry. It's Angel Larry's job. It's like, okay, I have an assignment for you. Go into the earth realm because Jesus needs strength. The one that's sustaining your very existence needs strength for the suffering that he's about to go through. Right? And what's amazing is all these pictures of the way that Jesus prayed and wept and was in tune in his spirit. He was both, he was both spirit and man. He was both spirit and human, right? It says Romans 8, 26, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. So when it says helps us in our weakness, what does that mean? That means Jesus in the garden, he said he can't pray. He didn't, he just has tears. He just has groans. Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, he just tears and groans. Jesus looking at Jerusalem, tears and groans. Jesus troubled in spirit in, in the face of great adversity. and try, He doesn't have words, but the spirit helps us in our weakness when we don't know how to pray. The spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Ah, uh, it's, it's, it's perplexing. It's embarrassing. It's how is that what is needed? Yet in the garden, what did Jesus need? Oh, Father, not my will, but yours be done. That visceral prayer that arises from the depths of our spirit. You'll only know that kind of prayer when you experience that kind of pressing. That's where we need to live. The Spirit of God. We don't know how to pray. Holy Spirit in our weakness, come and aid us. And we yield to that ministry of intercession from the Holy Spirit in our weak human frame like Jesus. But we pray from that place that is troubled and unsettled in our spirit until we prevail and we see God's will done. I believe with all my heart that's how Jesus was praying in the garden. And then it says he gets up and he wakes up his disciples and says the time, is, the time of darkness is at hand. But he is prepared because he's prayed through in the spirit under the unction of the Holy Spirit. When did that unsettled feeling come on him in the first place? I mean, it very well might have been right there in John 11, uh, um, excuse me, John 13, where it says he's troubled in spirit, right? Okay, John 13, 24. It says, Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was among them who spoke. So Jesus has just said, he's troubled in spirit. One of you will betray me. Um, who, who is the one? Peter goes, motion. So he's like, he, I guess Peter's over here <laughs> and John's over there. And I want you to get this picture too, that John, likely Jesus is reclining. So uh, I guess I'll just recline for you guys. So Jesus is like, is like this, because that's how they sat you know, on pillows and things. They didn't sit upright like we did. So Jesus is reclining the table. And then John, observing Jesus's distress, puts his head on Jesus's chest. And it's not because they're just like chilling that way. It's because Jesus is upset and John is comforting him. Wow. It's a familial picture showing the intimacy of their bond. It's an emotional Jesus. It says it's troubled. And John's observing that he's upset. And so basically, you know, John goes to give him a hug. Like he goes to comfort his friend, put his head on his chest. And Peter's like, Find out who it is, John. <laughs> Find out. Yeah. Is that cultural? Like, oh, totally. Like, yeah. Is that a lot closer than they are in America? I don't know. I, you know, I, I've read that before. That would be very profoundly. Like, that would be just super awkward if that were to happen between two brothers. Right. Now. But I mean, I've had, a, you know, maybe the equivalent way to think about it is like during times of great sadness, I've had people put their arm around me, right? Or hold me. I mean, I, I honestly was sad about something this past weekend and a friend held me while I cried. Yeah. There was a brother, oh, I love it. I'm you know? That, and so I think it's odd when you, I think it's odd when you take it out of the context of distress. But when you picture, I mean, if I had a close friend and I'm weeping or I'm troubled, and they went to hold me and comfort me, that wouldn't strike you as odd. That would be very natural and moving, right? And so that's what we have to picture. I think a lot of times we abstract the emotional intensity of what's happening in these, out of the scripture because it doesn't give us great detail. It just tells us Jesus was in distress. But you can see from the way that the, they interact with each other, it's like that's why John is, <laughs> has his head on Jesus' chest is likely because he's trying to comfort and be close to his friend. Jesus is saying, I'm going to, one of you is going to betray me. I'm going to go through this incredible suffering. And Peter's like, 
find out who it is, right? That's what I think. That's what I think Peter's thinking. And, and I think he's supportive evidence of that because the moment the, later on, it's, I think it's in Luke or Mark, um, but when the betrayer comes and Judas betrays him, Peter pulls the sword in that moment, right? So I'm going, you know, he's probably thinking, what can I do to go ahead and, and take care of this traitor right now, right? And, and that adds even more weight when Jesus goes, yeah, so you're not the traitor, but you will deny me three times. Right. Um, and so uh, G- Jesus' be- beloved disciple John, likely in response to Jesus' distress, put his head on his chest. They were deeply familiar in how they related to each other. John is the one whom Jesus would entrust his own mother. They were extremely close, right? So John nineteen twenty six. when Jesus therefore saw his mother, this is Jesus from the cross, and the disciple whom he loved, which we see in Scripture, that's the, this is on uh, Scripture, uh, John nineteen twenty six point A, under uh, John thirteen twenty four, it says the disciple be loved standing by. So the only recorded disciple that we see that actually makes it to the cross, to the scene of the cross, is John. And he's standing there, and Jesus says to his mom, "Woman, behold your son." He says, "Disciple, behold your mother." And from that hour, the disciple took her uh, into his own home. So Jesus was the oldest of his brothers. Mary, uh, we don't see Joseph in the picture at all, so she's widowed, right? So it would have been Jesus' responsibility to care for his mother as the oldest brother. And so in his final, one of his final acts from the cross is to delegate responsibility, and the person he chooses is John. And John takes responsibility for Jesus' mother. I mean, they were like brothers. Along with the siblings, too? I don't know how that works. It just says, it just tells us about the mom, so... But we know that he did have sisters because it tells us elsewhere that Mary and, uh, and Jesus' s- siblings are gathered together. I think it's in the book of Acts. But yeah, took her into his own home. And, um, and, so, and ironically, John ends up being the disciple that lives the longest. So I guess take care of Jesus' mom and, <laughs> and you're going to live. <laughs> you know, it says if you want to live long in the land, honor your mother and father. Wow. Right? First commandment with a promise. He honored two moms. Well, you, if you're going to take care of Jesus' mom, <laughs> you know you're going to be the last to be martyred, right? Um, and then John 21, 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, plunged in the sea. So those are the two places where John refers to himself. Three times in the book of John, he refers to himself. He, he gives himself the descriptor, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Confidence, and I think it was just the nature of their relationship. It was just any of the other disciples would have read that. They would have been like, you know, it's true. He did love John the most. <laughs> like, I always wonder how they all feel for John. I don't know, but John was bold about it. Oh, Peter took advantage of that. Yeah, well, John, thir- and Peter, Peter, yeah, Peter didn't mind. Peter is like, John, ask him. He'll tell you, you know. <laughs> so Jesus answered, uh, it is to him, and he, and he actually tells John, it's to him to whom I'll give a piece of bread when I've dipped it. Having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, we have this strange thing happening with Judas where um, two times the betrayal is connected to things that would have been traditionally and culturally associated with fellowship. Okay, So we see he, G- Jesus gets betrayed with a kiss, and Satan enters Judas once Judas takes the bread and, you know, and I think, I think some of what's happening there, let me finish reading it. It says, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas has the money box, Jesus said to them, buy those things we need for the feast or should have given something to, to the poor. But having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately and it was night. So Judas takes the piece of bread, but I believe in that moment it exposes at some level what's in his heart. Right, because he basically says, "I'm embracing deception. I'm giving the appearance that I'm in fellowship with you. I'm giving the appearance that we're together, but the reality is we're not." And he takes it, and and in that act, he breaks the the fellowship. So the simple thought I want to draw out from the passage above 
is that the offering of the bread was a sign of fellowship, yet you, Judas takes the bread with the intent to already betray Jesus, and immediately in that moment he's possessed of Satan, it says. And I think it's even possible that Jesus is not just speaking to Judas when he says, what you do, do quickly. I think he may actually be speaking to Satan, who has now possessed Judas. Um, which just adds a whole different dynamic to the upper room. You go, okay, you got, you've got the disciples, you've got Judas the betrayer, but just like Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit and in the spirit realm, his spirit is distressed and there's interactions in the spirit realm, just like we're gonna go to the Garden of Gethsemane and there's gonna be angels there in the garden. Like in the spirit realm, we're not talking about some demons, right? We're talking about the prince of demons, the the, the king of darkness, Ezekiel 28, describes Satan as the anointed cherub who covers. I establish you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. I just think that passage shows us the ancient mystery of this angelic being that was Lucifer, the angel of light that fell to darkness and now that demonic being is in the upper room in the night Jesus is betrayed. And he hates God. He doesn't want to advance God's purpose. But yet he finds himself caught up in God's sovereign plan. Can you hold questions to the end? And I'll, I'll call on you. If you want to write it down too, that'd be great. And so Judas would later betray Jesus with a kiss. I took this from the website below as I was reading, studying. In the culture of first century Israel, a kiss was not always a romantic expression of love, rather a kiss on the cheek was a common greeting, a sign of deep respect, honor, and brotherly love. And there are a number of passages there that kind of reference that biblical idea. For a student who had great respect for his teacher, a kiss fell within the healthy expression of honor. Wow. Um, and so Judas chooses, because it's dark in the garden, right? I've been to the Garden of Gethsemane um, in Israel. They have these ancient olive trees, some of which may have actually been there in the time of Jesus. Wow. And you go into the garden, you're like, oh, like they wouldn't have known which one of these 12 men in the darkness was Jesus. So they needed to come by torchlight. They need some way. And it's like, it's like they didn't have social media, right? They didn't have FBI's most wanted. So there was no way to distinguish to these Roman soldiers who wouldn't have been familiar with which one of them was Jesus, which one of the guys were we supposed to grab? Because they're coming by night and they're going to grab and get out of there. They don't want to fight, you know, and Peter's going to come swinging at him in the, out of the darkness. And that's the situation. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a raid. It's a midnight raid in the garden to capture in their mind this man who claims to be king. And we don't know what they're going to do. And so we found this guy who, Judas, who knows that that's where they would retire to pray, right? And he brings that inside information and he leads those that are going to capture Jesus to him. And then he identifies him and he uses the choice because he knew Jesus would accept it. And Jesus says to him, Luke twenty two forty seven, while he was still speaking, Jesus is saying this to his disciples, hey, arise, hour of darkness has come in Luke. Um, and get that, he's not judging that by anything in the natural. He's prayed through in the spirit and he knows in his spirit, okay, the, the time has come and I'm about to go face my trial and he's waking them up. Just observe the sensitivity to Jesus, to what is occurring around him. He knows darkness is coming and there uh, behold a multitude and he who was called Judas, one of the 12, went before them and drew near to Jesus and kissed him. Whew. What must have broken in Jesus's heart in that moment? Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Mm -hmm. We think a lot about Jesus' physical suffering. What was the emotional suffering that Jesus went through when his disciples fell asleep on him in his hour of need? All he said was, hey, could you not watch with me an hour? One of his beloved disciples betrays him with a kiss, and then his number one guy, his rock on whom he was going to build his church, denies him three times. And we see in one of the accounts that when it tells us that when Peter denies him the third time and the rooster crows. Jesus actually looks at Peter. We like I said, we focus a lot on the physical suffering, but the emotional suffering of Jesus, right? And it says, it says he was in every way tempted as we are. What was 
even what was the temptation to be offended to be angry to say forget these <laughs> forget these guys <laughs> like it's not worth it you pour your life into a group of people and in your hour of greatest need they utterly abandon you and then the father himself it's, jesus says my god my god why have you forsaken me last of all the father himself withdraws communion from the Son, something that never happened in eternity past, and Jesus plunges into darkness. Thank you, Jesus. So now once Judas goes out, it says once he had gone out, Jesus now says, okay, now the really important stuff is going to happen. Right? I've washed your feet. I've set an example of loving your enemies. I've given you guys some, some instruction. There's going to be a betrayal. He's troubled in spirit. And then I think Jesus gathers himself and says, Now the Son of Man is glorified. God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glory him in himself and glorify him immediately. And so he's saying, there's something I'm about to go to that's going to be glory. Again, remember the Messianic prophecies. When he keeps saying, I'm going to be glorified we all know, oh, he's going to be glorified in death and resurrection, right? They're thinking, okay, now we're talking. All that betrayal stuff is over and dealt with. Now we're talking about glory. That's right. Let's talk about the, the king of glory coming into the city of Jerusalem and taking over. Little children, I shall not be with you a while longer. You'll seek me, and I, as I say to the Jews, where I'm going cannot come. So I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. Later on, they say, we don't understand what you're saying to us. Because it seems like he's saying contradictory things. I'm about to be glorified. I'm going to be taken away. Right? The, the, it's a mystery. Looking back, in hindsight, we understand it. Um, but it's very mysterious, the things he's describing. And so he explains this new commandment. So Matthew 5, 43, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus explains this whole idea of loving your enemies, right? You've heard what's said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so he says is, God is kind to people that don't deserve it. God loves people that don't deserve it, so you love people that don't deserve it, right? And if you're called to love people that don't deserve it, you're certainly called to love people that are your friends and your family. And so he's going the most extreme example from the very beginning. He was teaching what it means to be a child of God in the kingdom of God as you extend love to the most undeserving, right? So my question is, if he taught that from the beginning, then why did he tell them when he said, love one another, why is he telling them that that's a new commandment? I think it's because of the thing, and so what that caused me to believe is it's the way he qualifies what it means to love one another. He says, as I have loved you. And when he puts that descriptor on it, what he's doing is saying, I'm asking you to do something more than just be kind to those that don't deserve it. What I'm asking you to do is love in the like manner that I'm about to demonstrate love for you, which is pointing directly to the cross. And John gets this message clear enough later that he writes about it. First John 2, 4, I'm sorry, 2, 2, 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. So he's going, okay, think about this. Sermon on the Mount, right? Like love, this is all the law and the prophets. Hang on, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he's going, I'm not giving you anything new, okay? And then in verse 8, again, a new commandment I write to you. So is it an old commandment or is it a new commandment? John literally back to back, he says, I'm not giving you anything new. What he means is, Okay, you've heard this before, but you've never seen it like this before, right? A new commandment I write to you, which this thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light but hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He goes, this is what it means to be a Christian who lives in light and not in darkness. If you want to define it by one simple behavior, love your brother, love your sister. Is that a covenant change? Uh, I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to address that. 
now, but he's going, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the old commandment, but now I'm giving it a, I'm giving it a new expression, a new commandment I give to you, um, love in the way that I'm about to demonstrate love to you. And then he writes again, 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. So it's not that he's telling them to do something new. He's defining it in a way that's unprecedented. He's defining it in this is what love is. Look at Jesus on the cross, right? His body broken, his garments rent from his body, saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It's one thing to say, love your enemies. But then when you look at it in the context of the new commandment he gives them, we go, okay, so there is absolutely no room for me to not show mercy. There's absolutely no room for me to not forgive because Jesus forgave me and it was my sins that put him there. John 13, 36. Man, I didn't, I think I, I was like, I don't know if I have enough for tonight, but we're doing great. We're going to ride on time. So now Simon Peter said to him, what, it, what caught Simon's ear and all the things that Jesus just said? I got the glory part, but where are you going? (laughs) Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? Uh, You just got to love Peter. He's like, he's like, uh, you know, if you have no, if you, uh, if you, uh, don't let me wash your feet. You have no part of me. Okay, wash my head and my hands too. Jesus is like, you can't follow me. He's like, why can't I follow you? I walked out onto the waves with you. Like, we got a good thing. Go- I'm, I'm your number one guy. I'm the guy that's there, you know. Show me what, show you. If someone's going to betray you, let me have Adam, right? Why can I not follow you now? I want to go where you're going, Jesus. And Jesus answered him, will you lay down your, and he goes, I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus goes, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you've denied me three times. Meaning rooster crows at the end of the night, right? By the end of this night, you're going to have denied me three times. Peter in the above passage vows his commitment to die for Jesus with a zealous and sincere heart and will ultimately immediately fail and deny Jesus three times, right? John 18, 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus, so did another disciple. That's John referring to himself. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her, the one who kept the door, brought Peter in. The servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servant and the officer who had made a fire of coal stood there for it was cold and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. John 18, 25. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore he said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter had cut off earlier, said, did I not see you with the, in the garden with him? He's going, I think that guy cut off my cousin's ear. <laughs> That's what's happening right there, right? <laughs> And so Peter's nervous because he's about to be found out because if he cut off the dude's ear, even though Jesus healed it, you know, that, that he's in a risky situation. But this is the same one who vowed, I'll die for you, Jesus. I'm going to die with you, right? Peter denied it again and immediately a rooster crowed. In Matthew 26, it des- Matthew describes even more vividly that Peter began to curse and swear, saying, I don't know, fill in the explicative, right? I don't know the, the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. It says he went out and he wept bitterly because everything that was in him wanted to come through, and he wasn't able to. He failed, and he was faced with his failure, and it broke him. I even think, as I was reading this, John 21, 18, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself, walked where you wished, but when you're older, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. He spoke signifying what death Peter would glorify God. So John later on says, hey, Peter, Jesus prophesied to Peter. I was kind of following behind him, listening to this conversation. And, and Jesus prophesies to Peter and says, hey, you're going to be girded and you're going to go where you don't wish to go. And there's going to be a time in which you will 
sacrifice your life for me. And in that moment, Jesus says to him, hey, come and follow me. And I think if you go back up in John 13, 36, Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward, right? And when is that afterward? After you've gone through being broken in your own strength, you're not going to have any confidence in yourself, but you're going to have full confidence in me. And that's when you're actually going to have an ability to follow me. And I love what Jesus says. The John 21, 19, he takes, he takes him full circle in Peter's journey. This is Jesus' last time. He's just performed a miracle similar to the one that he performed when he first called Peter, a miraculous catch of fish. John says, the beloved disciple says, it's the Lord. Peter jumps into the water, swims to him. They eat some breakfast together, and now they're going for a walk. And in that walk, Jesus reverses the three-time betrayal of, of Peter three times. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend your sheep. Then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And so he three times requests of Peter the affirmation of Peter's love. And then in John 21, 19, after describing to him the death that he was going to suffer and how he would ultimately die as a martyr for Jesus, Jesus says to him, his final words to him are, follow me, which if you go all the way back to Matthew 4, 18, it's the very first thing that Jesus says to him when he calls him at the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew's brother, casting the nets in the sea for they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What a beautiful picture that Jesus takes Peter all the way back to the beginning of his journey with him. And he says, Peter, you remember when I called you by the sea? I'm calling you again now. But Peter has gone through such a breaking and such a transformation. He's an entirely different man. On the night that Jesus is betrayed, Peter says, I'm going to give my life for you, Lord. Right? Jesus says, you'll betray me. three. <laughs> You're going to deny me three times. But there by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus says, you will in fact give up your life for me. The very thing that was in your heart in the upper room, you will see that through and you've become a different man and I'm ready for you because of love, because of the love that you've learned and the forgiveness that you've experienced from me, because of the love that is in your heart for me, you will follow me even unto death. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for the picture that is being revealed of your relationship to your beloved disciples. And I thank you for those in this room. Would you apply it clearly and plainly to their lives where you are calling them into that deeper intimacy with you? You're fashioning a unique story with each and every one in this room. And I thank you for the unique story with John, the beloved disciple who rested his head upon your chest. Peter, the one who would deny you three times but be restored three times by you at the Sea of Galilee, the one who would lay down his life, crucified upside down in the likeness of his Lord. I pray, Jesus, help us to see how you're weaving together our individual stories. Help us to hear your voice inviting us to come and to follow you. And I pray, Lord, that we would be those that rest our head on your chest. We would be those that embrace you at the deepest levels of our being. I pray even as we talked about the humanity of Jesus in the place of prayer, Lord, would you come and grip those in this class with the spirit of intercession? Would you come and be near to them? Would you teach them to pray like you prayed in the garden? Lord, I thank you for just releasing the knowledge of God through this class, releasing the knowledge of Jesus. Let us see him in the beauty of his humanity as one whom the angels had to strengthen. Let us see this man, Christ Jesus, this one who gave us a new commandment. Lord, help us to obey it, to love as he has loved us, even unto death. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen.